Hey, what's up, everybody? Um, so uh, today I'm going to do um, the 2.2 uh, video lecture. So this will be on the, uh, it's going to be about water and specifically the molecular structure of it and all these things. So make sure you watch this video. Uh, you have review questions also in this part. Uh, I will put them all together uh, from all the parts of 2.2. So they'll be all in one doc. And then after the review questions, uh, there's a 2.2 study guide that's also part of this. Um, so make sure you watch this, do the review questions, and then the study guide for this section. All right? So let's jump into it. Um, I will quickly screen share the slides with you guys. You guys should have these actually um, already in this um, in the post. So we're going to get into 2.2. This is all going to be about water. Um, so 2.2 is on water, 2.2 and 2.1 are gonna be kind of um, their shorter sections. Today we're gonna to go through the entire 2.2. Uh, part A of 2.2 is gonna talk about the hydrogen bonding, um, that water actually, that's a quality of water. Water molecules hydrogen bond with each other. Okay, H2O hydrogen bonds to another H2O, so on and so forth, and that's how water actually sticks together. But let's quickly talk about what that means. The first thing that we want to talk about is that water molecules, they consist of two atoms. This should be hopefully a little bit of you. You have oxygen, which is going to then be um, in this picture here on this slide, it's in red. Um, oops, this is that um, oxygen, okay? Uh, oxygen has eight protons, okay? Uh, then that's the O part, H2O. There's one O, so one oxygen. There's two hydrogens, as you guys see, they're going to be in this light blue color, and the hydrogens have one uh, proton, okay? That's why you only have one plus here. For oxygen, you have eight pluses, eight protons, eight neutrons, and then you have uh, the electrons are going to be the negative ones on the outside, okay? So because of the difference in protons between the oxygen and the hydrogens, okay, it's about the difference in protons, all right? Make sure you understand that and read that again if you need to. Oxygen attracts hydrogen <laughs> electrons towards it. So because of the difference in protons or the difference in positive charges between hydrogens and uh, oxygen, the oxygen attracts the hydrogen's electrons. So it will attract these negative charged electrons because there's so much positive here, there's eight positive charges, it's gonna wanna attract more negative towards itself. So it will want to uh, get these um, electrons from the hydrogens and attract it to the cell. Okay, because of this, this creates a partially positive and partially negative size of uh, water. Okay, this is the quality or the, this is the reason why we call water uh, as a polar molecule because water actually has a partially negative side and a partially positive side to it. Okay, we'll see a picture in a minute, but make sure you understand that's because there's a lot of pool on these electrons from the hydrogen because oxygen has this positive charge here, okay? And because of this positive, uh, partially positive, partially negative sides, that's what makes it polar, okay? So it's because water is polar, it is slightly positive, um, has a slightly positive uh, end or side and a slightly negative end or side, okay? And the way we look at it actually is gonna be really uh, interesting but really easy to understand it from this diagram. So the oxygen here is going to have the sigma minus or partially negative side. So the oxygen side of H2O is going to be the partially negative. Okay, Slightly negative pole is going to be on the oxygen because remember it's pulling on these electrons. Because these electrons are being pulled into the oxygen, this makes the two hydrogens or the hydrogen side of H2O molecule delta plus or partially positive. So the partially positive pole is going to be the hydrogens. The partially or slightly negative pole is going to be the oxygen. Make sure you understand that we have to write these delta plus and delta minus to show when asked which poles are positive, which are partially negative. Okay. So because even though the electrons are not distributed equally within the molecule, so they're not equally distributed because there's a partially negative side here and a partially positive side, water itself 
has no charge. It's a neutral overall. So consider it. It's not that it has a negative and a positive. It's just that some of the charges pushed up towards the, uh, some of the negative charges pushed up towards the oxygen. And because of that, it makes it partially negative and partially positive on the hydrogen side. But together, water is neutral. So make sure you get that kind of cleared up in your brain. It has a partially negative, partially positive side. So partially negative, partially positive. But when we look at water all together, it is neutral. It does not have a charge, which is good. Okay, Water is neutral. When water molecules are going to be around each other, okay, when they're kind of just swimming, hanging out with each other, they actually have hydrogen bonds formed between them. We um, see these hydrogen bonds kind of like attractions, even though we call them hydrogen bonds, they're technically attractions, but they're electric attractions. So that what happens is that electric attraction of one water molecule, so you have the H2O here and another H2O here. So from one water, water molecule to another, the slightly positive uh, end of the H here will be attracted to the slightly negative um, end of the O on the second one. So it's the hydrogens of one water molecule being attracted to the oxygens of the second water molecule. This here is called hydrogen bonding. They're electrical attractions. They're very weak technically, but these are called hydrogen bonds, okay? Usually we don't draw a solid stick like you guys saw in the 2.1 where we drew sticks from carbon to hydrogen. Those are actual um, covalent bonds. These bonds here are technically hydrogen bonds and we usually do either a dashed line or just dots. The, the easiest way to do is just to put dots from one, uh, the hy hydrogens from one uh, water molecule to the oxygens of the other. And you kind of see that here and here. And then the oxygen is attracted to the hydrogens of the other ones. Okay, so make sure you understand that. So hydrogens from one uh, H2O slightly are attracted or hydrogen bonded to the oxygen of the second. Hydrogen bonds are very weak. Okay, they're weaker than covalent bonds since the molecules are not attracted technically. Um, uh, sorry, since the molecules are only attracted technically, these are not strong bonds, okay? They are not bonded physically to each other. So this water molecule and this water molecule don't physically bond. They're just hydrogen bonding, but technically just being attracted to each other electron, uh, electrically, sorry. So make sure you clear that up in your brain if you need to, all right? You can feel free to pause and kind of, you know, look at the slide again if you need to or rewind me, however you want to do that, okay? Since water is polar, it can form hydrogen bonds with other polar molecules. So remember how we said um, things that like water are going to be polar, things that don't like water are going to be nonpolar, and like dissolves like. So if I'm polar, I want I will be okay with other polar molecules. And if I'm nonpolar, I will be okay with nonpolar molecules, but not okay with the polar ones. So. Um, let's see. So what we need to understand then is the fact that um, we have um, phospholipid bilayer. This is a really good example. And you have your hydrophilic water loving is going to be the head. So the heads of phospholipid, uh, phospholipids, the head is water loving. That means it's going to be polar and the tails are water uh, hating or water, scared of water. Those are going to be nonpolar. Okay, just make sure you understand that. So hydrophilic is going to be water loving. This hopefully is review for us. The hydrophilic part of the phospholipids is going to be water loving. That's the head. Um, they are polar because water is polar. So if you're water loving, you have to also be polar. Okay, so you have also a partially negative and partially positive. End, okay, and they are attracted to water. This allows them to dissolve in water. So water can dissolve other polar molecules very easily. Okay, so water dissolves anything else that's polar easily. Hydrophobic or water fearing are substances that are not polar. So like fatty acids we talked about in 2.1, they're not polar, okay? Uh, and they make up those tails of the phospholipids. So that means that the water cannot dissolve these hydrophobic molecules. And also the water cannot form hydro bonds with these hydrophobic molecules because if you hate or you fear water, how can you bond hydrogen bonding wise with it, okay? So they are insoluble in water. So that's why like if you take oil and water and you just pour it in the same bottle, eventually they're gonna separate and not wanna be hanging out together and water cannot um, 
dissolve oil because oil is insoluble in water because oil actually is hydrophobic. Oil does not have a partially negative or partially positive side. Oil is not polar. It will not dissolve in water. Okay. Oops. Oops. Okay. So phospholipid structure, make sure you understand. You have the, the polar head. Okay. That's water loving. Polar will be also attracted polar waters on here on the outside. Nonpolar tails will only want to hang out with other nonpolar things. So that's why tails will face each other. And that's what we see here. Tails will want to hang out with other tails because they're both nonpolar. And heads will want to hang out with water because they're polar. And that's what creates those tail attractions to each other. Okay? Because they cannot dissolve in water. So they want to hang out together. These review questions on 2.2a, I will put in a, a Google Doc and they'll be in there with the rest of them. So um, you're describing. Uh, defining, outlining, defining, defining, compare uh, the structure. So what you want to do is um, make sure you use these um, command terms and make sure you do them correctly, okay? Part B is going to be properties of water. So this is actually really cool. As things that are really light, like you see here with the large surface area, actually can technically walk on water, if you can kind of say it like that. And in this section, we're gonna talk about why that actually happens. So the hydrogen bonds uh, that form between water molecules give them a bunch of really cool properties. So because it, water can hydrogen bond with itself or with other water molecules, so rel a really uh, a lot of cool things that come out of that. Um, first thing, <laughs> cohesiveness. Um, and then we have adhesive, thermal, and solvent. So water, um, water properties that we're going to talk about in this section are going to include cohesiveness, adhesiveness, thermal, solvent. Okay, um, let us jump into it. Because hydrogen bonds form between water molecules, um, water is then can be a cohesive. What this means is actually water molecules naturally stick together. It's a cohesive. Um, they stick together. If they can stick together, they can technically provide, if you can kind of think of it like a surface, like a hard surface. Technically, it's not that hard but it's because it's water. But because they do bond together, they stick together and they can provide a hard enough surface for certain animals and certain little light bugs like what you see here, technically, to walk on water. If this bug can separate its mass altogether into these four wide legs, then that way it, it will not drown, okay? Um, this is also the reason why when you hit water, as you jump from really high, maybe let's say distances into water, you actually get hurt, uh, it really hurts when you hit water, right? Like belly flops and things that you guys like to do. But uh, uh, if you fall from a really, really high uh, distance, if you fall into water uh, or a body of water or lake or whatever, um, and you're actually coming at a really high speed, you actually, um, can hit it and it will feel exactly um, or cause exactly the same damage as you hitting concrete because water molecules stick together, they create a hard enough surface, okay? Many organisms depend on this property, property in habitat. So the fact that water is cohesive, they stick together, create kind of like a surface. A lot of animals rely on that. Insects, like what you guys see here, are able to stand on water and they're, you know, they're, they can kind of gather food, things like that. And this is, this whole cohesiveness causes a surface tension that basically means that surface can hold some weight, okay? And that's really cool. So the reason water can have a cohesive property or can kind of have the molecules stick together is because of hydrogen bonds. Plants also use cohesion to transport water molecules from the ground through the top of the tree. So remember, watering plants or trees or whatever you actually water the soil around it that water goes into the soil and then the roots pick up that water so if the roots pick up that water water actually has to then travel up the plant or in this case to tree and deliver that water to every single part of that tree including the top and the way it can actually do that is because cohesion water molecules stick together and because they stick together it's actually easy for the water to travel in larger quantities, if you want to say that, right? Like, like a, gl a glob of water versus one little molecule. So as molecules move up through the tissue, right, through these tree tissues, hydrogen bonds cause them to pool. So what, you're think what you want to think of is because water is co uh, cohesive, 
it pulls other molecules with it, kind of like a sticky glue that kind of goes up and pulls everything from, up, uh, from below up with it, okay? So uh, cohesion, part of this water traveling through the tree, is gonna be the part where it pulls other water molecules behind them, so you have a lot of water then can travel up. This makes water transport way easier for trees, okay? Hydrogen bonding also allows water to stick to other surfaces. This is called adhesion. So anything that's like sticky, like tape has an adhesive side. So if you have a double-sided tape, right, we call it both sides, then we're gonna have adhesive on it. Adhesive means to stick. So cohesive means um, to like basically create a hard surface or travel together, right, to pull with it up the tree. Adhesion, right, basically means it can stick to other substances. So along with cohesion, so together adhesion and cohesion together um, allows the plant to transport water in columns against gravity. So let me quickly show you what this means. Cohesion, so think of this like a, uh, a tree trunk that has like a tube for water to travel, right? What, let's say everything below this blue line is water. Every blue circle here is a water molecule. So cohesion causes water to stick to itself. Okay, one, other, one water molecule sticking to the other. So it creates like a blob of water and it creates surface. That's cohesion, water being sticky to each, each other. Adhesion basically is the fact that water can actually stick to surfaces. So this is the um, little vessel in the tree where water is gonna travel to the top. Adhesive means water can stick to surfaces, okay? Cohesion means water sticks to other water molecules. So because water can stick to surfaces, actually this helps water travel up because it can kind of reach up and stick to the surface above it. And then as water keeps coming, cohesion pulls up with it and then it can kind of keep, uh, go up again and stick to the size of these vessels. So what happens is it actually pulls the water up. Okay, uh, cohesion and adhesion work together. Make sure you know the difference. Cohesion, water molecules sticking to each other. Okay, that's the stickiness. Adhesion means water sticking to other surfaces. And these two work together to help water transport in the columns against gravity or in other words, up, okay? Plants also uh, use cohesion to transport, whoops, sorry, sorry, um, objects, temperature. So let's talk about temperature. So we talked about Cohesion, adhesion. Let's talk about temperature. The object's temperature is related to the rate in which molecules vibrate. So let's quickly talk about what that means. The temperature of something, okay. Uh, let's, let's talk about water, right, because we're on it. When water is cold, that means the vibrations are slow, okay. Vibrate, those water molecules are vibrating slowly. If water is hot, water molecules are vibrating super, super fast. This is why we get steam because they vibrate so fast, sometimes they actually escape the liquid and go into um, gas. But object's temperature is related to the rate at which these molecules vibrate. So as energy is added, basically heating up the water, vibrations and temperature increase. So the more we add energy, in this case, let's say we put a pot of water on the stove, we add energy through the bottom of the stove, right? We have a uh, you know, gas or whatever you guys use at homes to give energy to that pot. That pot then heats up and the water inside the pot heat up. As water heats up, that means the vibrations of the water molecules increase. They go faster, right? So hydrogen bonds hold water molecules together and slow vibration. So because hydrogen bonds are there, they're not super strong, but they're strong enough to kind of help those vibrations slow down. So what this means is there is more energy needed to increase the temperature of bodies of water. So water is very good at taking in energy and not really being overheated so fast. This is why we have to heat water for longer periods of time because hydrogen bonds help that uh, liquid, in this case water, actually keep taking that energy that's coming in and actually slow down those vibrations. So water is really good at um, taking in energy and then because of hydrogen bonds it can slow down those vibrations therefore we need a lot of energy to get that water let's say to boil right so we call this specific heat so specific heat of a substance is the energy that you need to increase one gram of water by one percent celsius i mean one degree celsius so water specific heat is 4.18 joules per gram or uh, joules over gram 
um, Celsius, which is way higher than most common materials. So if you look at this, it's really basically, in other words, it's, it takes a lot more energy to heat up water or increase those vibrations than let's say solid ice, dry air, granite, right? So what we're seeing is it takes a lot of energy to really get water to vibrate enough to actually heat up uh, one gram by one degree Celsius, okay? So specific heat of water is really high. That means you need a lot of energy to get water to go up by one degree Celsius, okay? So water's high heat, specific heat actually allows it to be stable for the environment, especially marine organisms, right? Because we have seasons, we have hot seasons, cold seasons, a lot of times in different parts of the world, but air temperatures can change super fast. So the air outside of this water body, like above it, right? Um, can change really quickly. You can go from hot day to a cold night, things like that. But what happens is water bodies slow down and cool very slowly because the ability of water to take in heat but slow down those vibrations. So it can be really cold outside, but the body of water, it takes a long time to get it to become cold. And that's good because you have organisms living there that maybe not are not able to survive it, but they can last long enough because overnight it can be cold but the water is not going to change that big of a difference in temperature so they'll be able to survive okay so that's really good for marine life also because of hydrogen's uh, hydrogen bonds water also has a high latent heat of vaporization which basically means energy needed for it to evaporate okay we call it latent heat of vaporization basically saying how do we how much energy do we need to get water to become vapor or gas right so when we talk about this, we have solid water is basically like an ice cube, latent heat of fusion, basically again, solid to liquid. And then you need a lot of more energy also added to get the liquid to become vapor. So what we're saying, it takes a lot of energy to take water from solid to uh, vapor or, you know, steam in this case. And that's really good. Okay. Because of water's high latent heat of vaporization, this helps organisms use it as a cooling mechanism. That's why when we're really hot, a cold bottle of water um, is actually really, really feels good to our body because it can take in, water can get in a lot of, a lot of your internal body heat because it's really hot when you're like exercising, or whatever, it's super, super high temperature in your body and can take that heat inside itself, but it won't evaporate. Okay. So when body temperatures increase, sweat builds on skin. When sweat leaves your body, that's actually going to bring with itself a lot of the hot heat energy that's inside your body now because muscles are working. So that's why sweat, when it leaves, it actually is a really hot um, substance because this water that's in your body is now leaving, but it's taking a lot of that hot or heat energy with it. So it cools your body, okay? The water molecules absorb a bunch of heat inside your body. So you drink water, water inside your body takes in all that heat from the exercise and from muscles, and then it can then leave your body and come uh, out into your, onto your skin, and then it can evaporate, okay? It just sits there until it evaporates. So this is the energy that is carried away um, and your body is cooled off. So because of this fact that water has high latent heat evaporization, that characteristic, right, because of hydrogen bonding, actually, that water characteristic helps the body cool off, which is really good. The following chart compares uh, the thermal properties of water to that of methane, okay, a nonpolar molecule. Since methane is nonpolar, it has a lower specific heat and latent heat of vaporization. So you have methane, right, and you have water. Water is polar, methane is nonpolar. And then when you look at these numbers here, you see that because water is polar and the hydrogen bonds actually can take in higher it takes a lot of uh, energy to heat it up it takes a lot of energy to actually have it vaporized a lot of energy to melt it and a lot of energy to actually boil it so this is a good thing okay because water is polar it has the ability to surround um, and dissolve other ionic or polar molecules this makes water super good as a solvent this is what we mean Sodium chloride is going to be your NaCl. This is basically salt, table salt, okay? Because water is polar and it can pool on these charges here, NaCl um, or salt, what happens is because it has a polar ability, it can make a super effective solvent. So it can have water or have a bunch of salt, pour water in there, and water will start 
taken the salt crystals apart because it will pull on these charges. And now you have NaCl in water or salt in water. And what you see here is you actually have to see the negative charges and then the water molecules, the red are gonna be hydrogens. They're gonna to try to bond with the negative of the um, salt piece. And then the positive parts of the salt are gonna to try to, bond, the water is gonna to try to bond the partial negative side to it. So you see how the water molecules surround these and based on what the charge of the uh, NaCl is, they will then twist, the water molecule will twist to whichever side needs to be attracted to. So the reds are gonna be your partial positive hydrogens. They wanna hang out with the negative part of the salt. Because of that, they technically pull it apart or dissolve this salt inside, okay? Because of this, water organisms can use water as a medium for like reactions, also for blood transport. So because of this uh, quality, organisms can use um, water as a super really good medium and solvent, okay? Uh, this is a good summary chart, okay? So you have water's properties, function, uh, property cohesiveness, what it does, reaction medium, what it does, transport, thermal coolant, solvent. So make sure you kind of look through the slide. You can pause this, um, and especially when you get to your study guides and things like that or our review questions. This is really good as a summary slide, okay? So feel free to pause, quickly read through it if you'd like, again, or review it, or come back to it. Review questions, I will throw these also on that same review question Google Doc. So uh, outline uh, the following properties. I'll throw that on there, and then you have four properties here to work with. Let's talk about blood transport. So C, blood is the primary component of water, okay? If we take blood and we'd like, let's say, start breaking it into parts, a huge part or most of the blood is actually water. This actually is a good thing because it makes an effective medium for transporting substances through the body. Water can transport a bunch of things because it's polar. It can transport a bunch of other polar molecules in your blood. So we're talking about red blood cells, white blood cells, um, platelets, all these things, okay? So glucose is a polar molecule. So because it's polar, water can actually be okay with it and glucose can travel through um, blood to where it needs to go. So because glucose is a polar molecule, it is hydrophilic, it likes water, it's gonna be transported by water. It can freely dissolve in blood, plasma, and it's easily transported through the body, which is good. We need glucose to travel easily through the body, okay? But glucose is polar, so water is okay with it. Sodium chloride, okay, these are gonna be an ionic compound, has a uh, sodium is gonna be your plus charge, chloride is gonna be your negative, right? It's an ion, has a plus, has a charge on it, plus or minus. Because sodium chloride, or table salt in this case, is the same thing, sodium chloride, it's ionic, it can dissociate, right? Water can act as a solvent into Na plus and Cl minus in the blood plasma and then flows freely. So these are gonna be our ionic um, compounds that travel in blood. So when we have salt, right? That's why our sweat is salty because that salt is leaving our body, but we need these to help our muscles not um, go into um, like cramps, right? That's why in Powerades and Gatorades, you have these um, ions, what they call them ions, but this is what it means, uh, ionic compounds. And they dissolve in blood, which is good. We can get these to our muscles so our muscles don't cramp. We need these ionic compounds, okay? And because they're um, ionic, they have charges, water can pull at or dissolve salt in itself, okay? The R group of amino acids determines how soluble it is. So remember amino acids from the last section, there's, uh, we said that there's uh, about 20 different R groups. The R group of the amino acid actually will determine how soluble it will be, right? And so the more polar the uh, R group of amino acid, the more it can dissolve, right? So they uh, all are going to be soluble, but some will be more hydrophilic or hydrophobic than others, okay? So make sure you understand that. The amino acids can travel in your blood, right? Building blocks of proteins. But depending on how polar the R group is, that will be determine how much or how easily they're gonna be dissolved and hydrophobic they are, okay? Oxygen, really important thing that needs to travel in our blood. Oxygen is nonpolar, so we come to this issue. Wait, oxygen is O2, it's a gas, it's not polar. So how do we get it to travel through our blood, okay? It's not able to efficiently dissolve in blood because it's nonpolar and water is polar, so we need to do something. Okay, to meet this need of cell respiration, what we have in our blood is uh, actually hemoglobin that is in red blood cells. Okay, so the he so you have a red blood cell. Okay, let's say this is the red blood cell, this big red circle. So the hemoglobin in the red blood cell 
is actually going to be where the oxygen will come and bind to. So if you understand the red blood cell is going to be this big circle, right? The hemoglobin is going to be inside the red blood cell. Because hemoglobin is inside the red blood cell, the oxygen will bind to the hemoglobin, and that is the way it can actually be transported in blood. Okay, so oxygen will not be able to uh, be transported in blood by itself, so it has to attach to a hemoglobin, which is really important. Okay, so without hemoglobin, oxygen cannot attach and travel in the blood and get to all the cells. That's why people with low hemoglobin count or low hemoglobin uh, amounts in their red blood cells actually have a hard time surviving or even doing any type of exercise because they're just going to run out of oxygen. It's not going to be enough oxygen traveling in their blood because oxygen is non-polar. It needs hemoglobin on red blood cells to travel. Fats are going to uh, be basically um, large and non-polar. So we have another problem. How do we get fats to travel in blood? Okay, they're insoluble because they're non-polar, they're large. So what happens is instead of the fats dissolving, they're actually carried in these things called lipoprotein complexes. So what we basically create in our body are going to be a single layer of phospholipids are going to create like a big circle. So you see these right here. These are single uh, layer phospholipids. So they're not like a cell. Cell is uh, a phospholipid bilayer. This is a single layer of phospholipids. Remember, the heads will then be okay with water, right? So think of it like a little bubble where the bubble is actually okay to travel in water, but whatever's in the bubble are going to be your fats, which are insoluble. So because we can take the triglycerides and uh, cholesterol esters, we can put them all, these are non-soluble lipids, we can put them inside this um, lipoprotein complex. And because the heads of this lipoprotein complex are okay with water, whatever's inside doesn't really matter because it creates like a big circle. And the water is like, oh yeah, the heads are polar, you guys are going to, travel through uh, water easily. So the blood can tr take these lipoprotein complexes and they can travel through the blood easily, but what's inside is actually non-polar. And that's how fats get around in our body, which is really cool, okay? Um, this layer allows it to dissolve um, and carry the hy hydrophobic contents throughout the body. So hydrophobic contents will be inside this lipoprotein complex, okay? Cholesterol, how does cholesterol make it? Cholesterols actually are small, but they're very insoluble due to large hydrophobic regions. So cholesterol is technically a very, very, very non-water loving molecule. So they're carried also in lipoprotein complexes along with fats. So we will find actually uh, unesterified cholesterol. So uh, cholesterol will be inside here with the other fatty acids and fats and things like that. They will be carried in lipoprotein complexes with fats, okay? All right, these review questions I will also throw on to the review um, question sheet. So that's it for 2.2. I know we did it all in one video lecture, but that's all right. I will um, post it in uh, our Google Classroom uh, post, and then you'll get the review questions all in one doc, and then I will post also the uh, 2.2 study guide. So it's short, and that's why we combined it with 2.1. All right, so I hope uh, you, if you need to go back, watch it again, it's all good. Um, so make sure you guys do this part and do all the assignments for it. Um, and uh, be good, be safe, uh, be peaceful, okay? Deuces.